is that as a community we have um, uh, made in the last many years there will be four presentation uh, unfortunately Dom, uh, Dominique from Caltech couldn't make it uh, as co-chair of this session so uh, I will have to do it uh, we are gonna have four presentations I'm gonna start with uh, mine which is NGA but let me find out how do I do it Very good. So I'm going to talk about the NGA projects because there are different projects under the NGA, NGA uh, umbrella. Uh, and then after me, there will be three more very exciting uh, presentations also. Uh, NGA falls within the category of Peer Lifelines program. Uh, and in the Peer Lifelines program, we have uh, categorized research uh, topics into uh, these things about uh, ground motion hazard, site response, permanent ground deformation, then substation equipment and structure, then network system reliability and emergency response. Uh, Lifelines program uh, ha has uh, initiated in 1996, in fact a little bit few months before officially NG uh, Pierre became National Research Center. I still have a scanned copy of $4 million check from Lloyd Cloth from PG&E who passed it to the Regents of the University of California and Peer Lifelines Program is started. Long-term partners of the Peer Lifelines Program are PG&E and Caltrans for almost two decades. Uh, and then uh, we have also had uh, other partners on specific uh, projects and these are cheap uh, contributions. Some of these uh, agencies contributed uh, millions of dollars. I, I don't mean that they're small contributors, but they contribute on a specific projects. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Department of Energy, Electric Power Research Institute, California Earthquake Authority, California Energy Commission, Southern California is an FM Global Insurance Company. I'm very proud of it. For the first time, we have research fund, and we still have research funding from uh, insurance industry. Swiss Nuclear, for the first time, we got funding from Europe uh, to support our project. BC Hydro, for the first time, we get funding from uh, Canada uh, to support our uh, uh, research, and as well as obviously USGS and smaller and other uh, funding agencies. Ground motion hazard. So my uh, focus in this uh, few, present, uh, few minutes presentation is about the first uh, block that you saw in your uh, lifelines program, ground motion hazards, and the next generation attenuation, as uh, Steve Main mentioned, the name uh, is not the best name, but we, uh, we are now stuck with the legacy and we are uh, using it. If you want to do anything in earthquake engineering, you have to have some models to scale their level of ground shaking with magnitude, distance, and other things. And the ground motion models, uh, or NGM models, are all about these ground uh, motion uh, scaling. They are heavily used in day uh, to day operation in probabilistic seismic hazard analysis, and they are used. Uh, for development of the U.S. National Seismic Hazard Maps that are fundamental of building code. Th therefore, whatever we do immediately goes to practice through National Hazard Maps and building code. Uh, so it's very, very uh, uh, user-sensitive uh, uh, project. Uh, there are three projects on their NGA. When we started, it was only one. Obviously, now we have three, and it's growing. Uh, the, the first one, as Steve uh, had it, uh, is for active tectonic region, uh, which is like California, Middle East, uh, uh, Japan, and part of Taiwan. That's called NGA West. The second one is for a stable continental region, basically is east of Colorado, NGA East. And for each of these, I'll show uh, a few slides. And the last one is obviously for Pacific Northwest or Japan and Taiwan, NGA subduction. The first one, NGA West, is complete. I'm gonna tell you what we are planning to do next about that. The second one is almost complete, 95% complete. We hope to finish it in the next two, three, four months. And subduction is still uh, ongoing. So I go, uh, in the next few slides, I go reverse. I talk about the one that is already is, uh, ongoing, and then I go to east, and then I go to west. 
in all NGF projects, as, as Steve May, uh, mentioned, really our legacy is that it's not one individual, one small project in his office publishing a couple of papers. Really, that's not the purpose. It's huge, multidisciplinary, many people involved in NGF West, 32 people were involved in NGA East, more than 55 people were involved. It's very, very challenging for technical management, but the impact is enormous. So it's huge, we subdivide large, complicated project into small pieces, and we distribute it, and then we bring it synthesis uh, back. That is the whole, really, the essence and the strength of all these NGA projects, the projects. Very collaborative, very teamwork. That is the whole idea. So, so having said that, these projects are not really my projects. This is our community projects. I'm a part of it, but these are, as I mentioned, 50 people, sometimes 30, 40, 50 people are involved. It's not one individual involved. It's a community project, but I was very fortunate to be part of that and coordinating a bunch of it. So, subduction. I start from the one that is still uh, ongoing. The focus so, uh, the, so, so far has been on the development of a large database for the first time. That database didn't exist. We started from zero to scratch. Uh, it's a, uh, a collaborative international effort, obviously Japanese, huge amount of data. So we have, uh, for the first time also, we broke the barriers and we have ground motion developers from Japan and Taiwan. They are, it's not only California Berkeley uh, issue anymore. It's international. We have collaboration continuously with Japanese and with Taiwanese friends. And we have lots of data from other parts of the world, Chile, Peru, Mexico, uh, and uh, others. Uh, the project uh, originally started with the uh, research funding from FM Global Insurance Company in Boston area. For the first time, we got uh, serious uh, research funding from insurance industry. USGS has always has been supporting with us, and Caltrans also has been uh, supporting the project, especially for Northern uh, California. Uh, the database is. Uh, almost complete, it's not 100% complete, but it's enormous database. We have about 288,000 records. We never had such a thing, it's huge. Yeah. And one reason is that from Japan and Taiwan, huge amount of data we have collected with very serious collaboration with Japanese and Taiwanese colleagues. Uh, we process them every single individual record with, uh, on the microscope. It's very high quality. It's the largest database ever uh, compiled and uh, uh, processed. Uh, huge database is huge. It's more than uh, a continental, a stable continent. Natal region and is more than uh, NGA uh, uh, West also. So the plan is that uh, for, since we have huge amount of data from Japan and then huge amount of data next to Japan is Taiwan, the plan is that instead of starting from big, making a universal uh, model and then we find out there are lots of exceptions in Japan and Taiwan, we start from bottom up. So we are going to have models for Japan specific, we are going to have models for Taiwan specific because we have complete all the database and then we generalize it. So uh, the concept is to finish it by mid-2017 and I worked really hard to get no cost extension from FM Global and uh, their lawyers but they agreed so we are going to shoot to finish it by mid-2017. That is NGS abduction which is still ongoing. Now we go to the east. Uh, NGA East uh, is for really Central Eastern North America, Canada included. We have uh, a very important piece of data from Canada. Uh, project is uh, mainly sponsored by Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Department of Energy, Electric Power Research Institute, and uh, USGS. This is the largest research project that here has ever had from day one is more than 5.5 million dollars overall. The impact is enormous. There are 100 nuclear power plants east of Colorado that already nuclear regulatory commission decided to adopt NGA uh, models and will be affected. The evaluation of all 100 nuclear power plants east of Colorado will be affected by uh, this project. 
This is the slide that I uh, borrowed from Christine Goulet, who has been heavily involved in this thing and running the uh, project. This is the, the data that we have in Central, Eastern, North America, including Canada, magnitude versus distance, and that's what uh, we have. And uh, uh, more than about 10,000 records have been processed. These are, as you see, moderate, uh, um, uh, small to moderate magnitude data. But this is the first time that we compile and we are processing them. And uh, the database, both time series as well as the spectra, are available to the public. Because they are compared to West uh, or uh, Japan and Taiwan, the database is really is not that rich because of that reason. So we had to rely on heavily on simulation, and there were various simulation, point source simulation, physics-based simulation. But the project is heavily based on simulation. So what the project did is that there were 18 models developed not by, by uh, Berkeley people, it's all over the U.S. In fact, several people from, from Central Eastern U.S. developed uh, uh, models, 18 models were developed. And then uh, for the first, not maybe the first one, but we did very innovative approach. And in fact, we have postdoctoral fellows uh, in the back, uh, Nico Cohen, from, uh, originally from Germany. He worked day and night to develop uh, methodology. So we use these 18 models instead of traditional way that we start, OK, we have 18 models. We sit in the room, oh, this model is not that too bad. The other model uh, is a little bit weak. So we put weights, subjective weights. We did an absolutely very state-of-the-art process. We assume that these 18 models are samples of thousands of databases, or thousands of models. So we generated thousands of models, and then we came back and discretized it. And at the end, uh, uh, 29 models were uh, uh, um, selected out of thousands of models. It's a very innovative approach. Uh, and then we waited those 29 uh, models. Several peer reports have been already published. No journal publications yet. We are uh, going to work on that one. Several, uh, and everything is available to public. Uh, the technical, uh, the status of NGA is, is that the technical part really is done. We have, we are in the, it's a really sensitive uh, um, uh, review process, very formal review process is going on by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. We are, we are being reviewed, they are reviewing all the details of these things and we are hoping to finish it by April, May of 2016. Uh, and then the final report of the project will be published uh, by Nuclear Regulatory Commission as a new reg for the first time. One of the research projects appeared will be published by federal government as a new reg by uh, uh, late 2016 and early 2017. As I mentioned, the project had involved uh, more than 55 people at different stages, not full time at different stages. So the money, technical management of that was really challenging. No, I'll talk to NGM list. So in October 2003, uh, the idea was uh, initiated uh, that instead of having various pieces and uh, ground motion developers that have their own database and they compete with each other and they don't share data and so on, we are going to break the barrier and get started. NGA project at that time we called it NGA. We didn't know West, East, and one, two, and so on. The project uh, um, uh, has been funded by Caltrans, PGE, and California Earthquake Authority. Then after 2008, we followed to NGA West two. Originally we had only called it NGA, but now we call it NGA West one because now we have NGA West two, NGA East, and so on. So NGA West two is the latest state of the art. This is what we had in 1997, the initiation of PEER, when PEER became, became National Research Center. Magnitude versus distance, is, each point is really recording a, a station. So in NGO West 1, we added a bunch of database, the size of database increased by a factor of three or so. Then in NGO West 2, we added a tremendous amount of data. I truly believe this is the largest uniformly processed ground motion database in uh, the world. It's very rich, very, very rich uh, empirical data, and it's not only California, it's uh, um, uh, all uh, active tectonic region like Middle East, uh, um, uh, Taiwan, uh, and Japan, and other places. 
All uh, response spectra have been uh, published and available to public. A huge databases that you can pop, uh, download and use it. It's very popular. The time series, not the response spectra, are, are available through this uh, web, uh, website. And the website has been going on. The new website is uh, uh, has been go, uh, going on for more than a year. And uh, Sylvia Maloney here, she worked very hard on that one. It's amazingly popular works, uh, website. There, are, it has about fourteen thousand users. When you when you want to use that website, you have to enter your name and email address and so on. There are about fourteen thousand users, and it's amazing. More than 1.5 million records have been downloaded. 1.5 million. I, I'm shocked when I saw Ben Silvia gave me uh, the number. Uh, it's enormously popular, even if we charge, you know, uh, not one dollar even, even uh, 10 cents per record, we are going to have a uh, really salary of someone to maintain the database. So, in fact, seriously, we are thinking about it because uh, we need. Uh, uh, funding to maintain that. It's very, very popular. NGMS2 completed in uh, 2014. Immediately, as the Steve mentioned, uh, uh, USGS adopted the models and it went through the national hazard maps, are now being used in the design and evaluation of tall buildings, dams, uh, nuclear power plants, and uh, various things, and then eventually is a part of uh, uh, building code. There are uh, there were other uh, side projects out in besides the horizontal ground motion. Uh, uh, three models for vertical components of ground motion uh, have already developed and uh, already been uh, published. Uh, soil classification in the building code for the first time after like two decades uh, have been adopted. Uh, John Seward was the leader of that part. Basically, the definitions of the class A, B, C, near soil classifications in the next version of building code very likely will be uh, adopted uh, as part of NGA uh, best 2. So the impact is really enormous. The definition of so-called aftershocks for the first time, we did redefined it as part of our ground motion models. So there are lots of epistemic uncertainty, lots of other things uh, that uh, produce this project. So intellectual impact of the NGA uh, West uh, projects, which again was shocking to me when uh, I checked it. Some of these publications since 2008, we are not talking about 1970s, 80s, since 2008, some of, some of these publications have been cited more than 700 times. 720 times, 933, 34 times since 2008 is enormous. The intellectual impact is really shocking uh, um, for all of us uh, who were involved in uh, these things. So, future plan. This is my last slide. Future plan for the NGA projects. NG, as I mentioned, NGA subduction is still ongoing. We are going to finish it uh, in a year, year and a half from now. Uh, NGA is, as I mentioned, is uh, almost done. The next step is to uh, organize many, many uh, journal publications because there are lots of reports and presentations in conferences uh, that will be going on. And then the plan is that maybe 2016 or possibly uh, early 2017, we are going to have a national tour uh, of the seminars, especially in Central Eastern U.S., uh, similar what we did in the URI uh, for NGA West, uh, to talk about the findings, models, and so on, uh, in the, especially in Central Eastern U.S. NGA West, three. Now you, know, you see three. It was NGA West 1, NGA West 2. We are thinking about uh, organizing NGA West 3 for 2018 to 2019 update of the models. We are thinking about new methodology about scaling ground motion, which includes uh, uh, really the challenging of scaling for very hard rock. Owners of them really they ask about what about our hard rock? Is there, uh, are the models reliable for hard rock and so on? So we have to do a better job of that. Uh, tail of the uh, range of the soil, we have to do uh, a better job on the softer side of the soil, and we have to take care of the real inelastic response and aftershocks, lots of issues. That's why I have so many dots here. So the plan for NGA is to go to NGA uh, West 3, and obviously, naturally, we have collected uh, lots of data since NGA West 2 that we are going to make it available also to public. Thank you very much. Uh, 
uh, before going to the next presentation, uh, if you have any question about NGF, please, because the next presentation is a little bit different topic. Any question about various NGA projects? Yes, David. I'm sorry, I was a very naive question. Lately in the engineering world, we've been working with 22 records, two directions, 44 records. Are we, how does this translate into that? And who's doing that? And when are we going to get a better set of ground motions for your source, for use in the engineering world? One of the key users of uh, the database, the 15, uh, 1.5 million uh, uh, download that I mentioned, uh, really are practicing engineers. The root researchers, obviously, they use it heavily. Practicing engineers, they use it on really daily basis or hourly basis. They select a range of their magnitude distance and so on, and then they download it there. There are some tools already on the website that you can scale, as Greg Derlite mentioned. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we don't have any um, magnitude 8 at 10 kilometers, so many data points, so you have to uh, uh, scale it. And there are some methodologies, and in fact, the plan is that we are going to expand the capabilities of the online database to help, again, uh, uh, the ground motion selection and modification for practicing engineers. But the database is growing. Every earthquake that happens, obviously, Computation and simulation is getting very strong, right? On the other hand, instrumentation because it's getting very cheap. So every earthquake now we get 500 or 1,000 records. So exponentially, the size of the database is increasing, which I hope to help practicing engineers in day-to-day -day operation. Well, it's not just practicing engineers day-to-day. -day. It's the research practice being done at a more practical level, like by ATC and by FEMA. Yeah, absolutely. Can we confirm that the 22 records set that we've been using for all this work is the good representative set? Uh, the, the, the number of ground motions available and scale obviously is uh, not a big deal from our side. The uh, uh, community, how many ground motions they use or uh, how to, uh, they can afford how many ground motions to use it is really uh, out of our control, but we hope it goes up. But I know for a fact tall buildings, I know for a fact tall buildings in San Francisco have been designed new tall buildings with only seven records, and they use mean of seven records and a standard deviation of seven records. But now, because after tall buildings initiative and so on, now that practice is uh, being updated. Jim. One of the rules that the Deschutes Brewery uses when they hire a new employee is that they want you to solve more problems than you create. When NGA West was created, I argued at the USGS Users Workshop that it would be destabilizing to the seismic hazard maps. And due to NGA West, one uh, seismic design values in, uh, where they had the Central Virginia earthquake, which was a known active seismic zone, decreased by 30%. So it became essentially same seismic design category as Michigan and Florida. And um, you can't have it both ways. The people that created the probabilistic seismic hazard analysis maps in the building code, the committee members never thought there'd be a ground motion higher than 30% G. So it was pretty consistent with what people were using in seismic zonation, but it's just, um, you get a more reliable answer if you just use the Richter relationship between intensity and magnitude at, at the fault. I checked that with all earthquakes up to magnitude 8 at court. If you convert the intensity to PGA or whatever you want, that's, I get the same answer as I do if I look at the actual recordings or if you You look at the actual recordings, and it's pretty robust up to magnitude eight. So all you really need to do is select a, a source, compute the intensity, and then understand how it will attenuate from the site. But to set the design level based on these numbers, it just created all the problems that were brought up at the 
this workshop, but were never addressed. So I, I don't know. And just because you have thousands of stuff doesn't mean it's not. It's still uncertain. Of course. And the people in Chile thought it was pretty ridiculous that you would have subduction zone attenuation relationships based on the, the nearest source to rupture. They've had five earthquakes larger than eight in the last five years, I think. And um, for a distributed subduction zone, it's it's just not, it's precise, but it's not accurate. Jeff, I think you're correct that uncertainty is, in, uh, is essential. If my friend and colleague, Norman Branson, is, uh, is like, he's using the, uh, like chess, he's saying uncertainty is the king in this uh, game, in this thing. It's absolutely essential because we don't, we are tons, tons of things that we don't know. So taking care of our uncertainty, as Greg also mentioned, and trickling down all the way to uh, risk is really the essence of our business. There is no question about it. So the, uh, the only advantage is that once we collect more data, we are hoping to narrow down and constrain the uncertainty rather than blindly deciding subjectively, basically. All right, we are uh, running out of time. The next speaker is Professor John Stewart from UCLA. He's going to talk about a very important new initiative, Next Generation Liquefaction, NGL. It's a new project, new initiative, and John is going to talk about what's going on about NGL. Welcome, John. Okay, so on that first subject of the need for the project, um, 
you know, most of you aren't too technical engineers, so I understand that. Uh, but for those who do ground failure assessment, particularly the factual risk assessment, there are three basic steps that we have to undertake. Susceptibility is just deciding whether you have a potentially liquefiable material or not. If you're not, then you simply exit this method and you go into something else. So clay, for example, is not susceptible to liquefaction. So that's one step. If you have a liquefiable soil, uh, then you would try to assess will it actually trigger producing strength loss. So that's looking at is the ground shaking strong enough given the density of the soil and whatnot to, to cause that. If you then have liquefaction, we're interested in quantifying the effects. So will you have a stability problem? Will you have a large landslide that develops? Will you have unacceptably large displacements from settlement? So these are the types of things we have to be able to do with liquefaction. In each one of those three cases, what we do is either empirical, meaning we're directly using data, or it is at least semi-empirical. There may be physical models, but they are calibrated carefully against data. So the point is we're heavily reliant upon data. And that's as it is now, and that's how it's likely going to be in the future. The problem we face now is that the data sets we're dealing with are very small. So Yusuf was talking about thousands, even in some cases hundreds of thousands of data points used to develop models. When we talk about liquefaction and some of the models we use there, we might be in the realm of tens or at most hundreds. So it's much smaller data sets. And as we look at those data sets, not all the data points are equally consequential. Sometimes you have data points that are especially consequential, and others that don't matter as much. This is a figure here for a, a liquefaction triggering model where a data point up here doesn't matter very much. A data point here has a big influence on the position of the curve representing whether liquefaction will trigger or not. This is basically relative density and intensity of shaking. As you change just a few points in that, it can have a big influence on where you draw that curve. And that's been the source of some dispute in recent years. Because the data is so small, it's also incomplete. We actually don't have data to do things we really need to be able to do for most practical applications, like look at liquefaction at depth, or look at liquefaction for large magnitude earthquakes that often control design, or look at liquefaction for high fines content materials. We are very data thin in all of these spaces, and also actually for strong shaking. So that's, our, that's where we're at. In our present situation is that we do have models for these things I've been talking about, uh, and they provide quite different outcomes. Okay, so the schematic on the right, which is prepared by Steve Kramer, kind of depicts that schematically. Uh, CSR is strength of shaking on the y-axis. PR is penetration resistance on the x-axis. The dots are, are sites that have liquefaction. The open circles are sites that didn't. And I can draw a line through uh, those separating it one way, and someone else might draw a line through separating those fields in a different way, and those would be two alternative models. They're very different, as it turns out, in what we're doing now in several respects, and it's interesting to think about why this is. Part of it is that uh, we have different methods, different developers of models interpret data in different ways. There is the potential, because we have not had the culture that uh, Yusuf was talking about, of sharing and exchanging ideas openly. We haven't had that in this field. There's potential that you could have errors in the interpretation of data that propagate through into the final model. The data sets that different model developers use are different, because there is no collective sharing of data. And uh, there isn't really any uh, direct interaction in a constructive way. Uh, between model developer teams. So the outcome of all this is that we have big differences between one model and the other. Um, those differences are not just normal epistemic uncertainty. You know, NGA produces five different models. They're all a little different, and that's considered to be a reflection of epistemic uncertainty. There's a little more here for the reasons I explained earlier. And these differences then have led to some pretty public disputes about my model's right, your model's wrong. And that leads then in turn to a lot of confusion among practitioners about what they should actually be doing. These things are practically consequential. So 
So NGL really came out of that uh, as an attempt to uh, update and expand uh, the database uh, that we're using to develop these models, to have a more transparent model building process, and as a result of all that, hopefully at the back end of the project to have vetted models that can be implemented rapidly in practice, much like NGA's ground motion models have. So we want to develop a community database that everybody uses the same set of data. We recognize from the outset we will not have enough data to constrain the models in spaces where they need to be applied, for example, the depth. Uh, so we need to have supporting studies for those parts. We want to have model development teams uh, all using that same data set, and we want them to talk to each other and coordinate, debug, and so on. Talk a little bit about the data resources and how we envision this. It's a little different uh, than NGA, just given the nature of the problem. We really have two ways of thinking about data uh, for liquefaction. There's a database that I'll describe in a flat file, and, and these have some important differences. The database we envision as a GIS platform uh, with liquefaction cases, other types of ground failure cases, and also cases where there was no ground failure that was observed. And the intent of everything going into the database is that it is objective, meaning that every reasonable person ought to be able to agree on what is actually going into that database. So there shouldn't be disagreements at the database level. The flat file is different. It's now a synthesis of the actual parameters going into particular models. And there is interpretation of data that goes into this. And so there is a degree of subjectivity. So we isolate the subjectivity at the level of the flat file. Just want to talk briefly about what is the case history. For NGA, a data point is ground motion. For us, there's a lot more to it than that. We have to have an observation of field performance. So someone has to have been out in the field after an earthquake and seen what happened. Uh, this is an example of that, where you have a, a, you the sea here, uh, and you have a spread, where this is the boundary of it, the lateral spread, ground cracks, sediment oils are mapped. Uh, and this is the sort of thing that we must begin with. You can't really do anything without observations of field performance. That needs to be written down, mapped, imaged in some way. We need to know when it happens and, and quite precisely where it happens. Uh, often after the fact, we come back and get to technical conditions. Of course, we'd like to know what it was like before, if, if possible. And for that, we need to know uh, these various things. The layering of the soils, where the groundwater is, soil types, and so on. Uh, we do need ground motions for this, so we need to know uh, how strong the ground shook at the site, um, and we need to know basically how long it shook, and this often takes the form at a minimum of a PGA and magnitude. Of course, we can go beyond that as well. Just to show you um, briefly where we're at in the GIS uh, database development process, we've essentially developed a platform that we're now filling in uh, and this is just to kind of give you a sense for how it's going to look. Um, so this is a map of the world, and when you log into the database, uh, you'll start with that. Um, before I get to this, I just want to point out there's all these fields over here. So you have, uh, for example, this is geotechnical exploration. This is a tag for just, uh, well, the showing sites or not. This is related to ground motion instruments, and this is related to uh, reconnaissance and field observation. So these are all checkable. Right now we're just checking the sites. And this is saying, well, in Japan we have, uh, at this time, eight. Of course, these, these numbers will grow quite a bit over time. If you click on that, uh, you zoom in on Tokyo Bay, and there's a number of sites here. Um, and one could then uh, click on a particular site, and you see uh, details of that site. According to this, I've only been talking 11 minutes. I don't know. Uh, so uh, this is now details of the site, where it is, a um, little bit of description of what happened, and you can download uh, details like site plan and cross-section. So this is a site plan. It's a little bit washed out on the, on the slide, but it's basically showing, uh, again, the reconnaissance, the ground cracks that were mapped, oil locations, in this case displacement vectors, and also locations of CPTs and ports. There's 
cross sections that would also be uh, available there uh, at that uh, site. If we now go and, and click on the ground motion stations, you can see all the different ground motion stations in red and blue uh, in the area, so you can see what was reported near your sites. If we pick a particular site uh, and we want to now look at the uh, geotechnical characterization, actually that's this up here, uh, we have CPTs, borings uh, with SPTs or tube samples, we have shear wave velocity. If one clicks one of those, you can download the data in various formats. And there are standard formats that have been developed by the project for boring logs, CPT, actually the first one was CPT, this is a boring log. Um, and finally, uh, the reconnaissance, so this is now documenting what was observed in the field. So here's an example. You click on that and you can see uh, it could be a map, or in this case, it's a picture of sediment oils in the park. So that's the database. The flat file, as I said before, is a synthesis of parameters. There's subjectivity, and I just want to briefly explain why I consider this to be subjective and, and what it entails. So, if we go to a particular site uh, that had liquefaction, uh, we have a CPT here. These are various numbers coming out of the CPT. This is a representation of the demand. So the first thing that one has to think about when you look at the developing a liquefaction model is what layer actually liquefied, and that's, or is most likely to have liquefied. And that's a critical layer. Just identifying where that is is subjective. Evaluating what the demands in that layer were during an earthquake uh, requires some representation of what the stresses were and how the stresses changed with depth. Those are all models, basically. So that's where our subjectivity is coming in. That demand is then modified further, and there's all these terms here, which I won't go into, uh, but the point is that they're making corrections for various effects that are themselves models. Okay, so. All of this has some subjectivity. That's why it's in the flat file, not in the database. As far as data collection is concerned, uh, this is mostly what we've been doing for the last year and a half. And this is just criteria that we used for selecting sites as being uh, worth our investment. So we've characterized sites where we have measured ground deformations, mostly in New Zealand and Japan. We've looked at sites where there's a ground motion recording either uh, if it had ground failure or if it didn't. Uh, we've um, particularly tried to focus in on sites, this third bullet's quite important, where we really have reason to think that if we could have good information from that site, it would help us to better constrain the model. It's, it's right near the sweet spot where uh, it can really have an impact. Um, and then um, part of this also is to really look for sites that it performed differently than what our models currently are telling us. And why is that? So let's, let's try to create problems for ourselves by characterizing sites that don't fit our models well. That's this last bullet here. And then see if we can figure that out. We usually learn a lot in the process. In terms of supporting studies, um, as I said before, you can't get everything from the empirical data directly. So these are used to constrain model elements that we really need to apply these things in practice. A lot of this will be lab testing or physical model testing, and this is really where the LEAP project comes in that Bruce Cutter will be talking about in a few minutes. So some of the topics that might be here, I won't spend much time on this for a non-geotechnical audience, um, but there's, I'll just suffice to say, there's a long list of things that we would really like to know better through these supporting studies. So in summary, uh, hopefully you can see some parallels with NGA. It's intended to be a community effort, uh, producing a community database and uh, probably more than one flat file. We want to develop models for all those things that matter, susceptibility, triggering, and various effects. Uh, we expect there won't just be one model. There'll be multiple models for each of those things, uh, which is fine. That's a healthy thing to have. Um, this will be translated into guidelines documents for our sponsors uh, and, of course, for the community as a whole. Um, and if we can do all this, uh, we think it will be very impactful. And uh, this is our current working version of the website. Uh, and uh, we do have a paper describing all this at a recent conference, which is accessible. With that, I will stop. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for John before we get to the other talk.
question for John Sewell on NGF is a very uh, futuristic, uh, important initiative. And uh, the support uh, is very likely to come in a huge way. We are hoping at this. But because uh, the idea of it, that we approach with various funding agencies, John and I, uh, all, anyone's the whole discipline we have to have. So we are, we are hoping to build on that and we get more support. Questions for John? All right, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. So the next speaker is Professor Scott Brandenburg from UCLA, and Scott is going to talk about uh, pile, soil pile kinematic interaction. Scott, welcome. <coughs> talk of this session did not involve NG. <laughs> I don't know if I even have those two letters together in the whole talk. I didn't get a memo about this. So I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, the influence of kinematic soil structure interaction on the foundation input motions for structures founded on deep foundations. And um, I'm collaborating with, with Jonathan Stewart on this, and uh, Ben Turner is the PhD student who's been doing all of the hard work. Uh, including hard work at like 1.30 in the morning. So he emailed me results that are in the talk that John hasn't even seen yet. <laughs> I put them in on the airplane on the way here this morning. So the motivation for this work is mostly for bridges. And it's for bridges where we have large diameter foundations and pretty soft soils. And the idea is that the ground motion appropriate for the, the input to the structure is altered by the foundation. So the um, Hazard analysis is done for free field ground motion records for the most part. Uh, and that may not be the right motion to put into a structure, especially if it's founded on these big, stiff piles that are maybe averaging out ground motion with depth. So our study is looking at how to modify free field ground motions to account for kinematic soil structure interaction. And we anticipate this will have impact for um, big foundations like those supporting the, the Bay Bridge uh, and soft soils like Bay Mud, right? It's not gonna have much of an impact for small diameter foundations and stiff soils because those piles just kind of move with the ground. All right, I'll start with a, um, so, some data from Japan. This is a, a site where uh, ground motions were measured in the free field and at the basement level of the structure and a transfer function was computed as the ratio of the uh, structural basement motion to the free field motion. And computing transfer functions is sometimes a tricky thing because you may not have a lot of frequency content in the motions and so you're taking the ratio of noise. So that red line is the computed transfer function and the green circles are the regions with high coherence. So those are more reliable data points. And what you see is that at low frequency the transfer function is near one. So if the ground is shaking slowly, the structure is just moving with it. But then as frequency increases, the structural foundation motion decreases um, and, and drops off pretty sharply at about a uh, little more than two hertz uh, in this case. So, you know, those green dots are kind of, you can think of that as, as the error you would be imposing on your structure if you took that free field motion and put it on a fixed base structure, right? So it's a pretty big deal uh, in this case. Okay, so let's talk about just the schematic of the problem that we're trying to solve. So here we have a, a pile and a, a soil column. Uh, that lowercase l should be lambda. I think that there was a uh, PC to map conversion thing. It should not be ng, just lambda. So I, I still think we haven't seen ng in the whole talk yet, right? <laughs> so if we have a uniform soil column, say with shear wave velocity of 200 meters per second or something like that, uh, and then a pile with a constant flexural stiffness, and we have soil springs all with constant properties, uh, we can come up with the equation for standing weight for the free field ground motion. We can put that motion on the free end of these springs and then compute the pile response. And I'm showing springs here. In reality, this problem can be solved more on a continuum level. Um, 
by solving a, a fourth order non-homogeneous differential equation. Hopefully it's late enough to show that. I think Greg showed some integrals already, so we'll go the other way here. Differential equation. So for the purely elastic case, it's easy enough to formulate and solve this equation. There's a closed form solution and just some constants that have to be solved based on the boundary conditions, like is the pile head free or fixed, and at the pile tip, is it you know, socketed into rock or is it floating or something like that. So if we look at those solutions at low frequency, like 0.01 hertz, practically static, uh, there's not much interaction, right? The ground is pretty much moving along a vertical line in this case, very little deformation because the wavelength is so long. At low frequency, the wavelength of the motion is very long. The pile is just moving along with the soil, not much kinematic interaction. Very small bending moments, mobilized in the pile. As we get up to one hertz now, you can see on the left plot, There we go. Uh, on this plot, this, this blue line is the soil deformation, and the red line is the pile deformation. So there's a lot more displacement now. The wavelength is now not so long relative to the pile head. And one thing I'll point out, for a free-headed pile, the top of the foundation might actually move more than the free-field soil. So it's not just a reduction. You might actually get an amplification of ground motion for free-headed piles due to kinematic interaction. That doesn't happen for fixed-head piles. If you force the pile to be vertical at the top, just like the ground surface, you don't get that amplification happening. Uh, and now, in this case, we're getting much more significant bending moments along the pile. OK, and then if we go to really high frequencies, in this case, 6.4 hertz, so not, not super high. I would apply the modulus reduction value of 0.1 here, too, so the soil is actually softer than 200 meters per second. But now we have quite a few wavelengths over the length of this pile. And those are all averaging out. So the top of the pile is moving in a much different way than the free field ground surface, quite a bit less in this case. So if we repeat that for uh, a, a range of frequencies in a more continuous way, we can develop these transfer functions. I was showing you results for a 2.45 meter diameter drilled shaft. That's a big foundation, right? That's not like a typical driven pile for a building. This is going to be a drilled uh, large diameter foundation. And the transfer function goes up for a free head pile due to that amplification, and then it drops off pretty strongly when you reach some transition frequency. Right? So uh, I would argue that we should be applying transfer functions like this to our free field ground motions so that we can get foundation input motions that are more appropriate for our structural analysis. And I'll point out that that transition frequency increases as you make the pile smaller. So this is a 2 foot, 0.61 meter diameter pile. Now we're getting the drop off at close to 10 hertz, it may not have much practical influence on most structures to reduce the ground motion, only at such high frequencies. All right, so there are some problems with elastic solutions, and this is why the Peer Center uh, wanted to fund our research, because the elastic solutions were all developed, but we weren't sure how applicable they were, because soil is inelastic at very small strengths, right? The elastic range of soil is so tiny that any earthquake pretty much. It's going to mobilize inelasticity uh, in the soil. The soil shear modulus is not constant with depth, right? There are all these constraints that come in for real sites that don't match the elastic solutions all that well. Soil profiles have layers, right? We don't have uniform um, soil. Uh, deep foundations may also become inelastic. You can get yielding of piles, especially near the connection with the structure. Uh, the soil structure interaction is inelastic, so we were modeling it with a constant KY in that elastic solution. Um, and then the soil structure interaction is rate dependent due to radiation damage. So a lot of these problems can't be included in that fourth order ordinary differential equation because you start getting non-constant coefficients and the equation becomes impossible to solve analytically, so we do it numerically instead. So as part of this work, we've developed a new PY relation. <coughs> In, in open seas. Uh, I think Ben is still not totally comfortable that all the key, kinks have been worked out, but it'll be released soon once he's comfortable that it's converging well. Uh, the reason why we had to develop a new spring is that some of the old ones um, don't tend to fit real soil behavior in the small strain range very well. They work pretty well for like a pushover analysis. They don't work so well for dynamics problems unless you carefully select the elastic stiffness. So the springs we developed have a very small elastic range, and they evolve in a realistic way at small stiffness. Uh, 
then also put a dash pod in parallel with the elastic component, and that's to model radiation damping. So if a pile is moving relative to the soil, it's propagating waves that go away through the soil, and it turns out you can model that wave propagation using a dash pod. So this is a schematic of the new PY Simple 3 uh, element that is soon to be released in open seas. And this is just an example to show the influence of that radiation damping. Uh, this was conducted on a single element at a frequency of 10 hertz. You can see without radiation damping, you get this back bump curve. The PY Simple 3 model has a little bit of degradation associated with the uh, bounding surface plasticity formulation we use. With radiation damping, you get much fatter increases, so it's chewing up more energy, and you get an initial stiffness that's higher too, because it takes more energy to propagate that wave out through the soil. So what we did with this is ran six uh, baseline soil profiles, then selected soil profiles to be consistent with some uh, cone penetration test soundings that we uh, borrowed from USGS from throughout California. Uh, we took Jack Baker's 40 input motions for rock sites. He intended those motions to be used for, with a ground response analysis. And then we uh, ran deep soil analyses on those six profiles with 40 motions, so 240 total ground response analyses. We recorded all of the deformations, not just the surface, but all the deformations of the various nodes in the nonlinear ground response analysis, and then imposed them on the free ends of PY elements that were distributed along the piles. And we did four baseline piles with diameters of half and two meters and length over width ratios of 15 and 30 to kind of cover the range where we think kinematic SSI is going to be important and solve those for fixed head and free head conditions. These are the uh, VS profiles for the sites that we studied. So site one is the softest, you know, in red here with uh, surface shear wave velocities under 100 meters per second, increasing out to site six, which is uh, quite a bit stiffer. And these are the properties of those foundations that we analyzed. Uh, sorry, the contrast is not very high. But this is the, uh, the crack section stiffness in, in uh, Make a Newton meter unit. So you can see that the small diameter piles are really a lot more flexible than those big diameter piles. Okay, now um, one thing that we did here was use a new definition for dimensionless frequency. In almost all soil structure interaction applications, we, we make the frequency dimensionless in some way related to the actual frequency and then the size of the structure. Uh, so a common dimensionless frequency is omega v over vs, where omega is the angular frequency, v is, say, the, the width or half width of a footing on the surface, and vs is the shear wave velocity. That misses a few things for piles, because piles have a length, they have a flexural stiffness, that's not in that first definition of dimensionless frequency. So we adopted this definition here, omega over lambda vs, where lambda is this parameter. This was actually part of the solution of that fourth order differential equation. And it's uh, kind of like the inverse of characteristic length for a, for a pile. So uh, this actually incorporates the, the flexural stiffness of the pile. And then, uh, of course, our sites are non-uniform. So we don't have a uniform value of PY modulus or shear wave velocity. So we're defining those to be uh, the, value, the average values over the active length. All right, and so we ran all of our open seas simulations and came up with this uh, cloud of, of data shown here. So if this was an elastic analysis, all of the points would lie along a single line. So the difference is because of the nonlinearity of the ground response analysis, because of the nonlinearity of the soil pile interaction. Um, and then we, we formed a, a functional form here for our regression and fit this dashed light blue line through it. And for comparison, we're looking at a couple of analytical solutions for these uh, transfer functions. All right, so you can clearly see a drop off. This frequency increases. This is for fixed headed piles. The ground motion is decreasing. Right now, whether this matters depends on whether your motion is exciting significant frequency content in the range where it's less than one. And that will be the case for big diameter piles and soft soils. Okay, when we go to free head, uh, Soil, this was one of the 1.30 a.m. results that Ben sent to me. Right, now we're seeing this amplification. That's because the pile head might move a little bit more than the ground surface, and then it drops off at 
at higher frequencies, and it compares in, in character reasonably well with these results from antibiotics. Um, now, these are transfer functions. We know also that uh, structural engineers do a lot of spectral analysis rather than time series analysis. So the transfer functions have limited applicability to cases where you're analyzing a time series. So we, we're also looking now at spectral ratios. This would be a spectral modification factor you can apply for a spectral analysis. Um, these are going to depend now on the size of the foundation, the stiffness of the soil, and also the shape of the input spectrum. So the amount by which you modify a spectrum depends on the spectrum itself. The spectra are not as fundamental as, uh, as transfer functions when you're looking at these sorts of problems. Um, but we're seeing the spectral ratios are coming down quite a bit, especially at short spectral periods, uh, because those tend to be controlled by higher frequencies that average out more along the length of the file. All right, we're also starting to look at ground motion incoherence. So some pile groups are pretty big, distributed structures. The ground motion at one spot is different from the ground motion at the other spot. More averaging happens when you have incoherent ground motion. So that may bring these transfer functions down even a little bit more. And this is uh, work that we've been collaborating with Tim and Chetta on. He has an algorithm for computing ground motions that are spatially distributed and adhere to a uh, coherent structure. All right, so conclusions are that foundation input motions for structures on deep foundations differ from free field motions. We should be accounting for that, and it's because of kinematic soil structure interaction. The effect is biggest for big diameter stiff foundations and better than soft soils. Uh, we've done our transfer functions so far. Uh, we're still kind of looking at spectral ratios. Those may change a bit as we continue to uh, hammer out some of the details. We've literally only had like uh, you know, nine hours to think about it so far. That was a plot that Ben sent me at 1.30. Um, and we're gonna develop some tools too. So some of these equations might be a little complicated to implement, so we plan to develop tools that researchers and practitioners can go to, plug in some numbers and get the uh, result. Just to even see if it's an important thing for your project, maybe as a screening tool. You can identify whether you wanna do a more sophisticated analysis. All right, thank you. Presentation. Questions for Scott. Soil pile foundation interaction. No question. I think there's one. Yes. Mom. For large piles on soft soils, uh, if we ignore the interaction and keep the the piles that they have rate of motion at their foundation level, one of the piles. And the soil being too soft, it's more being driven by the piles, the large piles, rather than driving the piles. Uh, would that be a conservative estimate, generally speaking? Uh, would this be a refinement to it? it? It wouldn't necessarily be conservative. So let me, let me go back to the slide showing the these are the fixed head transfer functions. Okay, for elastic solutions, these transfer functions can never be higher than one. The soil is uniform. They're always going to be less than one. The numerical simulations have some that go higher than one, even for fixed head piles. Okay, and the explanation, there are a couple of possible explanations. The one is that if you have layered soil, the stiff, deeper soil may grab hold of that pile and move it more, whereas the waves get attenuated through the softer soil at the top. So it, I think in general would be conservative, but not, not always. No, we want to consider all the mistakes. Yeah. Yes. Jim. I've always been troubled by this um, concept that the ground motions creep into the building through the foundation. Uh, and also, if you have a transfer function that Whenever they record in the free field, sometimes you get different results based on the pad or facility your instrument is placed on. And you get all this interference, maybe even from other buildings. So I always thought, as a geologist, that when you have an earthquake, the ground moves, and the building by inertia wants to stay where it is. So it always made more sense to me that uh, 
whatever gets to the pile is being generated by the building response and not little ants or cooties crawling into the, to the basement. So there's always this issue of we need to distinguish between the assumptions and the facts and what the limitations of the assumptions are. And if you could clarify what assumptions are in this, but the, in real earthquakes, the variability in ground motion is more than can ever be explained by VS-30, so uh, it seems like you would have to have some reference to uh, borehole records to see what were artifacts and what was real. So, yeah, you mentioned that uh, some of the ground motion records are recorded on, on pads or, or slabs that might influence ground motion. Some are recorded in the basement of buildings. Those have a kinematic SSI effect. Right, if the slab is big, that effect is in that ground motion. We should probably be thinking about that, too. Um, in, in terms of how the ground motions propagate, our, um, we're not using VS-30 in a seismic hazard analysis or something here. We looked at real borehole logs, CPT profiles, came up with representative profiles, put the ground motions at the base of the 1D soil columns in deep soil, and then took those motions and put them into our foundation. And there, for us, there's not even a structure on top. So one of the questions is uh, related to inertial interaction. So how does this foundation moving around and then you have a structure vibrating on top? You know, we, we, we need to do that too. In the substructure method, we assume that we can separate things right at the base of the structure, which works well for linear elastic systems because superposition holds. May not work so well for uh, nonlinear systems. So that's something that we plan to look at too. Great. Any other question for Scott? No? I appreciate that. Thank you very much. The next presentation is by Professor Bruce Cotter of UC Davis, and he's going to talk about MIP, uh, uh, liquefaction experiment and analysis projects. Welcome, Bruce. There's a wide range of liquefaction problems, and therefore we recognize that 
we're going to require a wide range of experiments to be done, or uh, yeah, experiments, experiments to be done to validate the various types of numerical methods. And so really, we expect that there will be multiple LEAP projects. And so there's, we kind of designing the project, there's a series of LEAPs. And, and do it in small pieces, like let's work on this, have a validation exercise on that, and do another exercise on some other theme. I'll kind of try to come back to that idea a little bit. But in the LEAP concept, the validation is accomplished through a combination of after you do these experiments or before you do the experiments, yeah. Step A, if you want to validate truly, you need to do a prediction. Um, and so many times people call a prediction of an experiment a prediction even if it's done after. And so it's not really a prediction. Um, so that is really, I guess, the real proof of the pudding. But we also believe that there is a lot of value in doing simulations after the event, especially blind simulations. You could do an experiment and just trust people. We trust each other to keep the results um, uh, secret until people submit the prediction. The value of that is, for example, you know the initial conditions of the experiment more precisely. So you don't want to do a validation of an experiment and then find out the experimenter used a different density of soil in his experiment. Or the ground motion was different in the experiment than what you simulated. So B, you know, this uh, after the event, blind simulations are also valuable. But not only that, but um, after the event simulation, where you know all the results that you're trying to predict even. You know, that is really useful too, especially if you try to predict a series of events, like uh, the results of a small earthquake, a big earthquake, a large earthquake, and predict which, you know, the progression of displacement, the progression of pore pressures, the mode shapes, um, the acceleration distribution, all these different parameters. We have a lot of sensors. If you try to predict many sensors and many experiments using the same parameters of your numerical model, um, we say that, that's a pretty good accomplishment. Um, and if you can get a good uh, validation that way, yeah, it does validate the numerical method is capable of predicting that, right? But it does not validate a person's ability to pick the parameters a priori. So, you know, we, that's another kind of concept is when you're trying to do validation. Are you trying to validate a person's ability to calibrate the model? Or are you validating the model is able to do this at all? So, um, anyway, the LEAP is, it's got a, we built a database around LEAP and it's the, the uh, purpose of this is to archive the data from the experiments and the simulations and to enable calibration of the models, verification, and validation, um, all of those aspects. And so it, uh, I'll talk a little bit about, about the, the database, because I think that's the, the center of the, the, what it organizes around. But before I go any further, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, there's a lot of people that worked on this project, too. Um, it's an international project, as I mentioned. Um, we have. Uh, George Washington is the PI of the NSF, uh, or not George Washington, George Majid Manzari at George Washington University. <laughs> He's the PI of the, the NSF project. Uh, I'm a co-PI at UC Davis and RPI at, in New York. And then we have collaborators at Cambridge University in the UK and uh, National Central University in Taiwan and Kyoto University and Zhejiang University in China. All those ones, those uh, ones in blue, the names in blue are people that worked on experiments for the first series of LEAP. Um, and then uh, the, the names in green down here, uh, Virginia Tech, uh, Katarina, and Mike Beatty, and Pedro Arduino, um, and uh, Richie Armstrong, uh, now at CUS, they, were, they did simulations. They did some simulation exercises. And uh, uh, the red ones are PIs, are kind of the um, organizers. Um, and the bottom, the sponsors, the NSF, um, and also we have a technology transfer team. Uh, they the only DWR, or, uh, David Guterres of the uh, D DWR Division of Safety of Dams. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of people involved already, um, and it will continue to grow. Um, we're just, we, like I said, we just are finishing a planning project for this, and so this is kind of how we're planning to organize it. Um, basically, the, the center, it's organized around databases. And so um, we have one database that's soil properties. You need soil properties, you need material properties. 
for calibration of models. And so brain size, uh, max and min relative densities, and results from stress strain uh, tests and triaxial apparatus and direct shear apparatus, things like this are archived in the material property database. Um, there's a, another database where we have specifications for experiments in numerical simulations. Um, and this is kind of like, it lays out the sequence of the validation exercises, right? First we specify how to do an experiment. We distribute that. We repeat the same experiment at multiple sites so that we can get some confidence that the experiment is good. And then we also at the same time, if you're going to do a true prediction, we give the same specifications to the predictors and they do the prediction. After the event, you can have some recorded data put up there, so the after the event predictions can be put in there, etc. So that's kind of like uh, specifications. We can kind of think about just the specifications for our preliminary leap exercise. Um, this is a few of those. So the preliminary leap exercise was looking at lateral spreading due to liquefaction. And we have a rigid um, container of, uh, and filled with sloping ground. Oh, there. So here's a uh, soil surface, a metal container like this with sloping ground and series of accelerometers and pore pressure sensors in it. Um, the density specified, the ground motion specification is like that, and uh, we specify exactly where all these sensors should be in um, three dimensions. And then uh, these experiments were repeated at uh, six different centrifuge facilities. So maybe, I'm not sure how many people here know what centrifuge modeling is. I, I just kind of assumed that when I put these slides together, but I'm sitting here and I'm realizing maybe some people don't even know what, uh, don't know what I mean by centrifuge modeling, but basically we take the scale model I showed you before. It might be this big or it might be this big. And we spin it in a centrifuge um, to increase the gravity level. And while it's spinning around on the centrifuge, we shake it to simulate the earthquake. Um, the whole purpose is to increase the accuracy of the experiment because we get the correct stress level by doing this trick. Um, so it actually it works pretty well and there's major centrifuge facilities all over the world. Um, they model the thing with different scale factors at different G levels. You can see 40G, 44G, and down to 23G. That means they have the biggest model for this exercise. Um, this is the radius of the centrifuge that they use for these experiments. And then, um, once we do the experiments, we can put the experimental data there, we can put the simulated data here. They should be in the same database, because we want to compare the simulations to the experiments. We want to compare experiment to experiments, right? So, because we want them to be compared, they should be in the same database. So we have a series of these databases that are designed and structured in a certain way to facilitate the comparisons, calibrations, and validations. Um, let's see. Just some uh, results from that first uh, series of tests. I'm not sure that the contrast is enough here, but uh, the lines are a little bit fine. But we have uh, the um, uh, specified input motion is here, and this is the ground velocity. And you can see, if you can see these lines, you can see that they all pretty much match the specified motion in terms of the velocity. If you look at acceleration, you can see that there's some significant high frequency differences between these input motions. And this kind of difference is, is kind of what we expect because what you're trying to do is run a hydraulic shaker at scale time in, while it's spinning around in a centrifuge. And so we, there are, it's not possible to ver be very precise in the ground motion. Um, and then some of the results, maybe you can see, uh, this is the lateral displacement. You can see the cyclic um, displacement here for Zhejiang University in China. They got a significant lateral movement. RPI got a little bit less, and Kyoto University got less. One thing you can see is that the cyclic, the magnitudes of the cyclic are probably more well matched. Some, some people got very little permanent lateral, lateral displacement, but the cyclic values were not too far apart. That's maybe not surprising. Um, you can look at the water pressure distributions in that central array. So we put poor water pressure sensors at these points. Here, P1, P2, P3, P4. Um, they're, kind of, they're shown here. These are the input motions, but then all the different universities did the experiment, and we can see the different patterns of pore pressure dissipation and generation. 
or question of dissipation and gener uh, generation and dissipation. You see the same kind of cyclic pore pressure developing in all the experiments. The, the sites that have noisy input motion have noisy pore pressures and, and larger pore pressure response. So there are differences in the results, and a lot of it's explainable based on um, the differences in initial conditions in the experiment. Um, yeah. So uh, I think in the interest of time, this, I just flipped through this one. These are the acceleration distributions there for the six different universities. And I think you can see there's striking similarities and some differences in the motion. The amplitude of these spikes is very sensitive to initial conditions. But the fact that the spikes occurred in all of them, and there's a similar number of spikes, I think is, is an important thing to look at. Um, here's some results from numerical simulations. So here's one experiment, and here's a bunch of numerical simulations. Um, so I, I think there's some uh, a couple of funny things going on here. One, uh, one predictor had a, a smaller, significantly smaller pore water pressure buildup. The other one's all pretty much predicted liquefaction, 100% pore pressure generation. Um, but this one has quite a bit lower, and really that is the calibration process is different, it turned out. Okay. So, um, so one important aspect of this problem is we really not only, I mean, some of these use the same numerical model, but different calibration processes. Different people do it, so there's different aspects. Well, we're mixing up a lot of times when we do these kind of exercises, conflating the, the errors due to calibration process, errors due to the experiment, errors due to the um, numerical model, and we want to really break that down and try to attribute um, where is the source of the error, what are the reasons for the differences. Um, and anyway, now I'm on to conclusion. Uh, I said six centrifuge facilities performed comparable experiments that we used for prediction exercise. Um, it's important to repeat experiments um, to gain confidence. Cyclic displacements are easy to duplicate, just for example, but as you see the residual du uh, displacements are uh, sensitive, quite sensitive to small differences in the experiments. The variability between experiments allows us to better understand the sensitivity of performance to different initial conditions. So really, this gets, I think other people mentioned sensitivity here, and I think that looking at validating the numerical method, you need to know how sensitive is the solution to the numerical method chosen, how sensitive is the solution to the initial conditions, and how sensitive is the, the experimental result to initial conditions. Because when you're assessing deviation between two predictions, your experiment and the uh, a valid uh, simulation, you really need to interpret that in the context of what is the sensitivity of the solution to um, those parameters. Um, so many experiments, we, we want to, we're now in our next phase, we're planning to provide, do more experiments to provide a better basis for judging the quality of the data and the quality of validation. Um, we have some databases that are now public. If you go to NIST, it's still on the NIST website, and NARI is going to continue to maintain. If we go to NIST databases and you, you uh, uh, Google or search for LEAP, you'll find these databases. Um, results of the uh, LEAP planning project were very successful, we think. We've developed a protocol for sharing and archiving data um, that may be followed in the future leaps. We, got, we did that work of how to organize all the information and distribute and mobilize people and organize people to, to do the things. Um, and so, uh, as I said in the beginning, it's going to contain a series of leaps. We don't know how many. We're developing a process, and we've done a, a few, um, or two, are done. There was one in Kyoto, the first one. That looked at lateral threading and lammer box. And then we did this one I showed you some results from um, in 2015. And that was lateral threading in a rigid box. Um, and then uh, the 2017 one is probably going to be, uh, if we're successful in getting additional funding, um, is looking at really improving and quantifying the sensitivity and reproducibility of simulations and experiments. So we want to know how is the sensitivity and using metrics to compare quality of validation 
in the context of that sensitivity. Then these other ones are just question marks. It's an open thing. We, we don't know what's next after that, but there might be a leak that's focused on validation of numerical models for Earth dams or soil structure interaction or case histories. We could do leak not only based on centrifuge model tests, but on field uh, tests, field data as well. Um, interaction with peer is really important, uh, especially, uh, John mentioned this too, with, with NGL, um, the next uh, generation of liquefaction models, because um, we could do some experiments maybe to help fill in gaps in the, the database that they're developing for NGL, and we can use the data that they're archiving in the field to validate the numerical models. Thank you very much.